Welcome back to the Game Masters Academy. This is the show where we strive to make sure every one of your sessions is great. Thanks for joining me. My name is Greg. This week, I want to talk about seven commonly misused or used incorrectly per the way that the rules are written spells that are very common in D&D. First up is going to be Counterspell. Counterspell is a abjuration spell, an instantaneous effect. The components it has are somatic, and its casting time is one reaction. And there's a little asterisk next to that. And that is the part that we all struggle to remember. So we'll get into it. But uh, you attempt to interrupt a creature in the process of casting a spell. If the creature is casting a spell of third level or lower, its spell fails and has no effect. If it's casting a spell of fourth level or higher, then you need to make a ability check using your spell casting ability, and the DC is 10 plus the spell's level. So the asterisk, we go down to the very bottom, and it says, which you take when you see a creature within 60 feet of you casting a spell. So the idea behind this is you see somebody in the process of casting something and you use your reaction to counterspell it before they cast it and considering it's before they cast that means that you don't know what the spell is and so you cast counterspell before understanding what actually the spell that's being cast is and what the effect that it will have is so often we see as a DM, we will say such and such spell, and the players will say counterspell. And uh, we've both failed. Uh, the player has failed uh, because, uh, again, if you already know what the spell is, you can't counter it. It's already been completed. And as a DM, we fail because we did not provide the appropriate opportunity for the player to cast counterspell. Now, this is absolutely on us to ensure that we're not being jerks about this. But the way it's supposed to go is, you know, creature A begins casting a spell. You then look to your characters, uh, your party members, that potentially can cast counter spell, and give them the chance to counter it. Would you like to counter that? And they'll say, well, what is it? You don't know. You just know that they're casting a spell. And that right there is where counter spell is supposed to be used and how it's supposed to be used. The thing that we don't want to do, though, is we don't want to cast a spell that's a once per day spell for this particular creature, have, offer that, and then have them say, yes, I'm going to cast counter spell, and then say, oh, well, he was actually casting a cantrip, so it doesn't matter. So what you do is you write down what the spell is on a piece of paper, flip it upside down, and then you say, hey, you know, so-and-so's uh, in the process of casting a spell. If you'd like to counter it, this would be the opportunity. And they'll say, well, what is it? And you say, you don't know yet. And then they say yes or no. And then you can flip over the piece of paper and show people what the actual spell was that your creature or the big bad or anything else along those lines was in the process of casting. That is how counterspell is supposed to work. It is supposed to have a significantly higher chance or higher um, thought process go into it than just simply being like, oh, you're casting something that was going to kill Bobby. I will counter that. Our second spell is almost exactly the same, and that's going to be shield. It's an abjuration spell that you cast as a reaction, verbal and somatic components. And uh, basically what ends up happening is when you get hit, uh, you are able to then cast shield. It gives you a bonus of five to your AC, which could potentially turn that hit into a miss. And then that lasts until the start of your next turn. Also, if someone is casting magic missile, you would take no damage from that. So... Where we fail with shield is similar to where we fail with counterspell. And what I mean by that is 
when we roll for attacks, we should be asking uh, the player, uh, hey, does your creature, um, what's their AC? 18. Okay. So then I know it's an 18. I roll, I get a 25. I don't say that I got a 25. I just roll the dice and I'm supposed to say that that's a hit. And now the character has to decide whether they're going to burn shield or not, not knowing the result of the dice. So there's, again, additional thought process that's required in this particular instance. So the little asterisk for this reaction is which you take when you are hit by an attack or target, uh, targeted by the magic missile spell. Obviously, if they're getting hit with magic missile, it's different. Uh, it, obviously, it, shield just negates that. Done. But um, when it comes to actually hitting an armor class... We are supposed to be asking them their armor class and then letting them know whether or not they hit or miss, not what the actual result of the roll is, which means that shield becomes less of a absolute best option you know possible and potentially puts it at a position where it's still very good, but it might not be the best go-to solution considering you don't know if casting it's going to make a difference. So, like I said, very similar to the issue with Counterspell. Next up, let's take a deeper look at Speak with Animals. Uh, one action to cast, and it can also be cast as a reaction, I'm sorry, a ritual, which takes 10 minutes. Uh, verbal somatic components, and the duration is for 10 minutes. Uh, as written, you gain the ability to comprehend and verbally communicate with beasts for the duration. The knowledge and awareness of many beasts is limited by their intelligence, but at minimum, beasts can give you information about nearby locations and monsters, including whatever they uh, can perceive or have perceived within the past day. You might be able to persuade a beast to perform a small favor for you at the GM's discretion. So, where I see this used most often incorrectly is someone will cast the spell and then ask about information that's older than a day. Um, and you can see that it says that they have perceived within the last day. And so uh, it's, I mean, it's a squirrel or a beetle or whatever other beast you are able to provide them and find. Its intelligence should be reflective of that. Um, something that I would consider as relatively smart would be like um, a tiger. Uh, but a tiger still only has the intelligence of a three. And so we need to make sure that as DMs, we aren't just, you know, doing like a lore dump through the uh, thought process of a squirrel. And we actually portray the squirrel in a way that makes sense for what a squirrel is. So we should be uh, providing information that the squirrel would think would be important, as well as providing it in a way that is reflective of a low intelligence type creature. We're not going to have, oh, there's 27 of these guys on this area. Like, can a squirrel count past four? Probably not. And so we need to curtail our information giving to reflect what the actual perception of whatever this animal is that the party has found and provide the information through that lens and not just give them all of the information. Maybe you have a druid that's a shepherd druid in your party and they have speak with animals active all the time. I think it's speech of beast and land or something like that is what the feature is called. Uh, and so this is something that can be utilized on a pretty regular basis uh, as an RP tool, can be utilized as a way to gather information, and it's a great way to do so. But I, I still think that we need to be a little bit more conscious of the actual wording on the spell and how that uh, is designed uh, as far as game mechanics wise. Along those same lines, that brings us to the next one, which is Polymorph. So with Polymorph, let's kind of go through it here. Fourth level, 
verbal, somatic, and material uh, components. Casting time is an action. It lasts for one hour with concentration. And basically what ends up happening is this spell transforms a creature that you can see within range into a new form. An unwilling creature must make a wisdom saving throw to avoid the effect. The spell has no effect on a shape changer or a creature with zero hit points. The transformation lasts for the duration or until the target drops to zero hit points or dies. The new form can be any beast whose challenge rating is equal to or less than the target's or the target's level if the target doesn't have a challenge rating. The target's game statistics, including mental ability scores, are replaced by the statistics of the chosen beast. It retains its alignment and its personality. The target assumes the hit points of the new form. When it reverts to its normal form, the creature returns to the number of hit points it had before, the tra before it transformed. If it reverts as a result of dropping to zero hit points, any excess damage carries over to its normal form. As long as the excess damage doesn't reduce the creature's normal form to zero hit points, it isn't knocked unconscious. The creature is limited in the actions it can perform by the nature of its new form, and it can't speak, cast spells, or take any other action that requires hands or speech. The target's geared gear melds into the new form. The creature can't activate, use, wield, or otherwise benefit from any of its equipment. So, lots of things going on there. Yes, uh, taking a party member that's level 7 and transforming them into a giant ape is extremely beneficial. As it states, it keeps the alignment and personality of the actual creature. I'm sorry, not of the creature, but of the character. So you don't have to worry about transforming somebody and then having them just go completely uh, bonkers and start attacking your party. Uh, I, I guess at the same time, it's possible that they would, but uh, that's a choice, not because they have to. Now, something that does happen that we, I think, sometimes get confused on is the target's game statistics, including mental ability scores, are replaced by the statistics of the chosen beast. This is completely different than the way a druid's wild shape works. Whereas a druid's wild shape, you keep your mental ability scores and transform into the actual shape of the creature. You gain the hit points and the physical stats, but you can still use your like class abilities uh, within uh, Druid Wild Shape, and so you can get some pretty cool combinations going on. The most obvious is a Moon Druid uh, multi-classed with a Bear Totem Barbarian. Um, and so obviously that wouldn't work with Polymorph but it would with wild shape. And so one of the things that happens, I think, quite frequently, is we confuse those two. And we need to remember that Polymorph turns them into the creature straight out just the stat block that comes in the monster manual or the DMG or wherever it is that you're getting the stat blocks from. That's what they turn into. They don't get access to any of their other abilities that they had before, it is that stat block and nothing else, which means that including the three or the six intelligence uh, that comes with that. Uh, there's no speaking. Uh, you could technically communicate, possibly telepathically. Um, but the I actually don't know how exactly that would work. Yeah, I, again, it's one of those things. Does the new creature that you polymorph them into understand common? It would say in the stat block. If it understands common, then you would probably be able to speak to it telepathically because it knows a language. Uh, I guess it's possible that it could know any language uh, from the transformation and then be able to have a telepathic communication. Otherwise, there's no way to communicate with the person. So... You know, Polymorph works as an amazing spell. It's so varied in its uses. Uh, it's great as a last-ditch effort heal. You know, you've got a party member that's down to three hit points. Polymorph them into a giant ape. They just gained 150 hit points, and now they hit for 3d10. It's so there's, again, again, there's tons of different opportunities to use the spell, but we need to remember that they don't have any access to their features, they are literally the stat block for the creature that you turn them into and nothing more.
Next, let's talk about detect thoughts. Uh, I see a lot of times where uh, specifically some YouTube D&D uh, groups will basically play so-and-so asks a question, a different party member will say, oh, detect thoughts. Sure, that's great, but in order for you to cast the spell, you need to have verbal, somatic, and material components. And if you're not going to use material components, you have to have your focus out, wiggling it around as you do the spell casting. And so what ends up happening is we're casting spells in front of a potentially hostile individual while somebody else has a conversation with them. That's pretty hostile of an act that would generally get a reaction to someone casting a spell. And what I mean by that is if you just walk up to somebody and you start casting a spell, it's not that much different as far as a threat to a commoner as it would be if you were to just walk up and pull a dagger on them. And so we need to make sure that we have characters react to it appropriately. There's a lot of detect thoughts spell casting that occurs as though the spell doesn't have any components at all. And you can just walk around willy-nilly casting detect thoughts and trying to read people's minds without them knowing. They're going to know. Uh, they might not know what the spell is, but they definitely know that you're casting a spell. And so we need to make sure that we have NPCs and additional characters respond to spell casting, not knowing if the spell is hostile or not. Up next is invisibility. Invisibility is an illusion school of magic spell, requires one action to cast, takes verbal, somatic, and material components. Uh, the length of time is one hour, does require concentration, and it makes the person have the invisible condition. So there's a couple of things here. The invisible condition by itself says a couple of things. An invisible creature is impossible to see without the aid of magic or a special sense. For the purpose of hiding, the creature is heavily obscured. The creature's location can be detected by any noise it makes or any tracks it leaves. Attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage, and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. This is one of those things where they meant the right thing, but they did a poor job of wording the spell. So let's first talk about what it provides. Invisibility means that you are unseen. That does not mean you are undetectable. Those are two very different things. Invisibility means that you cannot be seen, but you still know the creature's location. This is the way 5e works. It's weird. So you're in a room. You see the other person cast invisibility. Based on their movement and the noises that they make, you have a rough location that they exist in. So you could walk over to wherever they are, invisible as they are, and attack them. You would just have a disadvantage on your attack roll. Now, if you had some other way to give yourself advantage on the attack roll, you would just attack with a straight roll. And uh, it's, I mean, it's really, it's that simple. The uh, invisibility by itself also doesn't provide you with any bonus to your stealth. Uh, I've seen people give people a plus five bonus to their stealth checks because they're invisible. Or I would, I've seen people provide advantage because they're invisible. And I think the biggest issue with why people provide advantage on stealth checks when they're invisible is because of some things they've seen on critical role. So in the instance that I'm specifically thinking of, uh, Travis's character, Chetney, it has the ability to cast invisibility, but he also has slippers of elven kind, boots of elven kind. And so what ends up happening is when Matt Mercer is asking for the stealth check, he's asking for a sound-based stealth check. And so a sound-based stealth check with those boots. The boots give him advantage on sound-based stealth. So what we see as an audience member is this character has invisibility 
and when he goes to roll for stealth, he has advantage. And we put the two together, and we think that one caused the other. Invisibility does not provide advantage on stealth. Which, we could probably get into an entire different segment on the way stealth breaks down. Stealth is actually multiple things. Stealth is hide. It's also how quietly you can move and how well you're capable of masking your scent. So when it comes to invisibility, we actually are looking at multiple things. So in order for me to be undetectable, if I'm invisible, I need to roll a stealth check still to mask my sounds as well as the scent that I have and ensure that all of those things beat whatever the competing check is. At that point, I am undetectable. And if you wanted to attack me, you would be able to find my location at all. But only after I beat the passive perception of the characters or the they beat the passive perception of the creature. And then I can choose to roll and use an action to roll perception to try to actively beat the stealth check that they made. So all of that for invisibility. Uh, It provides the invisible condition, which is completely bonkers. So what I mean by that is attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. Well, that comes from just being a hidden or an unseen attacker. That's just the way it works for unseen combat. So if I am stealthed and a creature cannot see me, then they could attack in where they think my last location was at disadvantage. And if I'm still there and they hit my armor class, they would still hit me. If I am unseen and unheard and I attack a creature that is unable to detect me, I gain advantage. So what ends up happening by putting that little bullet point on there, the second bullet point for the invisible condition, basically means that C invisibility has no use at all. Nothing. It doesn't do anything. If I cast C invisibility on myself, I can now see the invisible creature. And that invisible creature walks up and still gets to attack at advantage because the condition gives the advantage to the attack roll. Even though I can see it, I'm literally looking at them and they get an extra bonus to their attack because somehow they missed this when they were doing playtest. So just something to put out there. I uh, home uh, brew that the invisible condition does not just automatically grant advantage or disadvantage. It basically works the same way hidden and unheard um, attackers Uh, work. And so basically, if I can't see you, then you get advantage. If I can see you by casting C invisibility, then you don't. Very simple. Last but not least is going to be zone of truth. Okay, so zone of truth is an enchantment school spell. It takes one action to cast. It's got a 60 foot range and it creates a 15 foot radius sphere. Its components are verbal and somatic, and it lasts for 10 minutes. Forces a charisma saving throw, uh, and you basically you create a magical zone like we talked about until the spell ends. A creature that enters the spell's area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there must make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, a creature can't speak a deliberate lie while in the radius. You know whether each creature succeeds or fails on its saving throw. An affected creature is aware of this spell and can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as it remains within the boundaries of the truth. So the way that this is used that I see that is not correct is you cast zone of truth on somebody and now they have to tell you the truth. That's not what it says. Forcing someone to speak and say true words is not the same as saying that someone within the range of the spell cannot lie. So, you get caught stealing something. 
Somebody casts zone of truth on you. They ask you a question. You say nothing. They ask you another question. You say nothing. You basically can just plead the fifth through the whole entire spell. It only lasts 10 minutes. They can just ask questions and questions and questions. You don't say anything. It's over. And so I see this used all the time as the interrogation technique to try to get the true answers out of somebody. And literally all you have to do as a character or as a creature that this is going through is just not talk. You could also talk, but ensure that everything you say is true, but also potentially not quite the answer that they're asking. Uh, And so this is not the specific interrogation type spell that you really truly are looking for. Um, And so what ends up happening is we cast Zone of Truth. We expect it to be a truth serum where people are unable to not respond with the truth itself and get all the answers out of whoever it is that they're talking to. And in actuality, all it basically does is prevent someone from just flat out lying to you. And that's definitely not the same thing. Anybody that's ever seen a political uh, conversation occur between like members of Congress and random people that they talk to, well, they'll ask questions. And then the random person starts answering questions that are completely not related to the question that was asked. And they just play this game of back and forth where the person asks a very yes or no question and the other person is refusing to say yes or no. That's basically zone of truth at work. Um, And that's the type of stuff that drives me insane. Like, if you're not going to answer the question, just say, I'm not answering you. Like, why are you answering 17 other questions? Uh, Because you don't want to say whatever it is that you're being asked. And so zone of truth uh, is very much... That's how it works. It is uh, just providing people uh, with the, I don't want to say the ability, but the inability to lie. If you are looking to have the absolute best spell possible for interrogating a criminal, it would definitely be suggestion. It lasts for eight hours, and you can basically word your suggestion in a way where they feel like they have to tell you everything. So you can just say, like, you will answer all of these questions honestly and in a way that doesn't cause harm to you. Well, now when you ask the question, they are compelled to answer from suggestion. So every single person that is trying to use zone of truth, use suggestion, get smart with what your suggestion is, And you will be able to get significantly more information out of the people that you're trying to interrogate using the correct spell. So that is it. Uh, Seven spells that are used, I don't want to say incorrectly, but they're not used the way that they were designed to be used. Now, plenty of them are uh, spells that... Maybe you decide that that's not the way you want to run them and it's more along the lines of when someone says lightning bolt, you want to be able to say, I counterspell that or that that's something that's okay at the table. Great. Maybe when combat uh, happens, you say, hey, does a 17 hit you? And the wizard can say, yep, but I'm going to shield it. And you're comfortable with that. Great. More power to you. The point here I'm just trying to showcase are incorrect uses. And if it's being used incorrectly and it's because you choose to do so, more power to you. That's the best part about Dungeons and Dragons is the freedom for us to be able to make things the way we want. But at the same time, I always prefer to have the information and then be consciously making that decision as opposed to just not knowing. So I uh, appreciate each and every one of you. I'm sure you've heard it a bunch of different times, but please, if you would leave me a comment or a review through the podcast sourcing that you get the show from, uh, that would help out greatly. Um, Please follow uh, the channel, uh, follow the, the show, so that way you can never miss an episode. 
And uh, like I've said multiple times, uh, we'll be doing a Patreon at the very beginning of the year here uh, just to give an opportunity for people to support the show that choose to do so as well as provide some additional little goodies um, for those that do. I appreciate each and every single one of you. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I hope your sessions are amazing. And as always, let's let the dice decide.